Good thing they make crystal wine glasses, you know. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Glad to see you're all here. We've only got about 16 Good people here this evening. evening. But, uh, Good evening. But I'm sure we're I'm sure we're going to get more as we go along. Normally we're in the range of 30 to 40 people who show up, and everybody is always welcome. I hope that you're telling some of your friends about our meeting so they can come online and find out about what's going on in Russia and other places. This evening, we've got a, a special speaker for you, somebody who um, walks on water if you talk to the people in, in Rotary headquarters, but uh, I think he's got web feet, so I think that's why it's so easy for him to do that. We have a very good guest speaker this evening, and we're going to be giving you out information. We got some new information about our own project, the Children's Rehabilitation Center. We've had a few more donations come in, and we're getting close to our third child. So we got two down, we're gonna keep going. We want 10 for the year. So we're gonna keep pushing that project and taking donations and making it happen. So those are things that are kind of going on with us. What I need to do is to welcome everybody here tonight and, oops, I pressed the wrong button. I need to welcome everybody here tonight and in doing that, I need to go to my president's comments as I always do when we open these meetings up. And in my president comments, I would like folks to realize that normally we've been getting anywhere from as few as five to as many as 10 different countries represented at our meetings. And it is super. We really, really do it. We cannot believe that a club so small as ours can have the reach around the world to reach so many people. And Randall has been bringing in high positioned and highly qualified speakers, which keeps the people coming back to our meetings. And we want to be that conduit of information so that we can get the word out about what's going on in Russia and help Russian clubs grow and help the world know a little bit more about Russia. Along the way, as our speaker is going to speak this evening, it's not just about Russia, it's about other places also. And in fact, we're going to find out about somewhere that maybe some of you not have not heard much about Haiti, but we're going to hear about it tonight. We want to reach out. We want to grab, and we don't know how long we're going to be able to do this. We don't know where Zoom is going to reach. Before you came online tonight, we were having a little bit of chat with some of the other people. And one of the questions is, have any of you seen anybody on Zoom from heaven? Not yet but maybe in the future. We have no idea how far this is going to reach, but we know that it is out there and is bringing the world closer together. And I think any effort that's going to bring the world closer together is helping to bring more peace to the world because people understand each other a little bit better. So if that's the, the method we have to use to get to where we wanna go, then we're gonna milk it for all it's worth and try to get as many people connected as possible to promote peace, to promote understanding so that we understand each other around the world. So those are my opening comments tonight. I'm gonna to pass it over to our secretary, Mr. Randall Eastman. Randall, would you please uh, give us a little bit of information? Thank you very much, President Michael. Let me share a slide here, just one second. I think it's going to work. I'm going to try this. Okay. Uh, I'd like to say a few things, a couple of things here today. First of all, I mentioned last week that our the district team has made some stock videos. This is the one that I thought was the coolest. Uh, just uh, stock videos that we can use for the People of Action campaign in our own projects on our in our own social media and our social media needs a little bit of work and it needs some support so i would <clears throat> i've noticed that uh, maybe after my appeal last week we now have 26 smart engaged people who are following our youtube channel and as michael has said we've uh, been able to take advantage of being stuck behind a computer screen over the past 14 months, I guess, at least 13 months. And in the summertime, we really started to invite 
high powered speakers like we have today to come and join us. And we have uh, uh, recorded those sessions, edited them slightly and made them available to anyone who would like to see it. And we really have had some amazing uh, presenters. Uh, and so we could say that we punch, have been punching much uh, bigger than our own weight. Last week, we had Sharon Tennyson speak to us, who spoke about the power of impossible ideas. And uh, each week for the next couple of months, we have some more powerful speakers coming to join us. So it makes it worthwhile for us to be able to reach out to you and ask you both to speak and join our meetings. It would be wonderful if you could share with uh, your friends our YouTube channel so that we could have some more followers. Second thing I want to share, I just I sent this to Pastor I Director John earlier today because I and I realized that uh, this is something I think it came it was from Toastmasters that I came across this site which I've been using in our little newsletter uh, notices every week. It's very very helpful if you go to timeanddate.com if you're and at all engaged in doing anything online. This is an amazingly useful tool. Uh, just this one tiny aspect of it is uh, something that I use all the time to share with anyone who's reading our newsletter when our meeting takes place in our time and in their time. And many countries in the world change their time uh, seasonally and so it can be really confusing to nail down when exactly is our meeting taking place in your city. And even Naples, Florida, I was delighted to discover that Naples, Florida is one of the options there, so I could send that off to John today. So if you need a tool for your own meeting, this is a great one, and it costs uh, zero to use, which is always good. Second thing I want to share with you uh, is this project. So each week, our district is sending out a newsletter and I try to extract from it something uh, that I think is relevant for our own members and our visiting guests from abroad who are not reading Russian newsletters. This one I thought was uh, really powerful because uh, I watched uh, Ivan Pisarov, who's past president of Vladivostok Eco Rotary Club, past president of the Vladivostok Eco Rotaract Club. He is himself an ambassadorial scholar and he's now a, a professor at the Far Eastern State University in Vladivostok, which is the, which is an agglomeration of several universities in Vladivostok, and it's also the center for the annual, um, gosh, what is it called? The annual conference that uh, President uh, Vladimir Putin holds to put Vladivostok on the stage reaching out in the region. So there is an incredibly high, high profile event that takes place on that university campus each year. Uh, I've had the chance to visit the university campus with uh, past president uh, Robert Kluger from Dalian Club. And we followed up on that by supporting a project, but it really is, it's a special campus. And as Ivan told me today, it has designed very much with uh, the needs of people who are disabled in mind. So unlike St. Petersburg, which I think if you were studying in a university campus downtown here, it would be very, very difficult if you're disabled. But uh, the campus in Vladivostok, uh, Far Eastern State University is very, very well equipped to accommodate uh, young people who are disabled to come and study. And Ivan has just launched this project, which is called Sasha, we're waiting for you in order to encourage Rotarians and others to help identify disabled uh, uh, students who are graduating from high school, who have the capability to study at a higher level, but perhaps might not because of their own fears because of the fears of their families and because of uh, perceptions of the conditions of the universities. And if I can just uh, escape here for a second, I want to show you something which I just discovered today, which is also quite cool. 
And let's see, stop share. So right, let me admit we've got a few people in the waiting room. Let me get them in here first. I'll get the, I'll get the waiting room. Here, let me make you a co-host now. Now, second thing, I just I want to share this uh, video, but I want to share show you how how it actually uh, uh, what I discovered that would make it work. There's another guest. So here is this campaign. Now you all know what YouTube is. Unless you're in China, in which case it's blocked, you don't know. But at the bottom of the uh, of this uh, YouTube page, there is a little control panel here. There's a and there's a CC. There's a closed captions button. I don't. We had this issue with the video that we shared uh, from the Center for for the Rehabilitation of the Child. I don't know if YouTube automatically always generates closed uh, captions. But here you can see, if you look at, I hope you can see on the screen here that when I press this button, we can see that there are Russian auto-generated closed captions. And then if I go to this uh, control panel here, you can see, again, Russia auto-generated uh, closed captions. And then I was able to click here and I discovered this auto-translate button. And I could do this in Armenian, but I think for the sake of uh, our visitors from Florida, we'll just stick with English here. And I want to see, uh, uh, I want to play this for you and see if it actually works. If you see the closed captions now, these are auto-generated, so computer-generated translation of the Russian closed captions. And then uh, this is a short video which just introduces this campaign. It's only a minute. Как в жизни встает вопрос о том, чем заниматься после школы. Многие решают получить высшее образование и начинают искать информацию о поступлении на сайтах вузов. Для обычных старшеклассников принятие решения об этом не является такой большой сложностью, как для старшеклассников с ограниченными возможностями здоровья. Саша, мы знаем, что тебе особенно тяжело принять такое решение, поскольку не все вузы способны обеспечить комфортное обучение. Ведь им не приходится задумываться о том, найдется ли для них там место, смогут ли им там помочь, будет ли в их университете доступная среда, будут ли в нем пандусы и лифты. Мы хотим обрадовать себя, сообщив, что кампус Дальневосточного федерального университета во Владивостоке – это доступная среда без барьеров, которая идеально подходит для людей с ограниченными возможностями здоровья. Здесь все продумано до мелочей. Объекты университета строились с расчетом на обучение и студентов с УВЗ. Ты сможешь полноценно жить и учиться здесь. Не бойся, тебя будут окружать понимающие люди, которые всегда готовы помочь. Саша, мы ждем тебя. Саша, мы ждем тебя. Саша, мы ждем тебя. Приезжай. Нет. Саша, приезжай. Мы ждем тебя. Саша, мы ждем твои документы. Саша, приезжай к нам. Мы ждем тебя. Саша, мы ждем тебя. Саша, мы ждем тебя. Саша, мы ждем тебя. Приезжай. Okay, let me, whoops, got to stop that it's going in the background there. Uh, I wanted to share that with you because Ivan also he asked me, can we find someone who is 17 years old, who's finishing high school in St. Petersburg, who is disabled, who could come potentially to Vladivostok to study in his campus? And he's appealing this week to all of our Rotarians in the district to uh, join that campaign. And that's, uh, Michael, that's all. Okay, very good. If any of our colleagues on the screen right now, if any of you know of someone who's approximately 17 years old and might be interested at all, contact us and we'll pass that on and make sure the information gets out there. And we can certainly ask our friends, but also some of you know people living in Russia already. So maybe there's someone here that you know that could be helpful, somebody that might be able to use that information. Okay, I'm going to go, Randall, I'm gonna to go to the slide share and take care of the other diplomatic things that I'm supposed to take care of.
as soon as I get there, where am I, where am I going to get there at? That? I'm going to get to here. And as everybody knows or come to our meetings, we always do the four-way test. If you will all please turn on your microphones, unmute yourself. Please turn on your microphone, everybody, please. That's up the show mistake to me. Okay, I'm going to read the four-way test one, one at a time of the four. After I finish, if you will please repeat it so that we can all say the four-way test. It's the four-way test of things that we think, say, and do. The first one is, is it the truth? Is it the truth? Is it, the truth? Is it, the truth? <laughs> is it fair to all concern? Is it fair, is it fair, fair to all, all concern? <laughs> will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be all good will and will better, 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 better friendship? And will it be beneficial to all concern? Will it be beneficial to all concern? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Go ahead and mute yourself again, please. If everybody will mute yourself again. Thank you very much. I decided to add to our normal presentation our mission statement. I think most of you already know it, but sometimes we forget it because we don't see it often enough. We're here to provide the service to others, promote integrity and advance world understanding. That's what I was talking about in my opening address. And I mentioned that because I went back over the mission statement today. We also need to advance goodwill and peace through fellowship of business, professional and community leaders. This is supposed to be our mission so we need to sort of keep it in mind when we're not only making decisions with the four-way test, but also when we get an opportunity to tell somebody else about Rotary, what we do and where we do it, feel free, take the, take the opportunity to pass a few words on to them. It'll help everybody. There are some meeting protocols that I need to go over. First of all, please be sure you keep your microphone muted and your camera on. This is going to be able to, so we can see your smiling face. The speakers we have, when they are speaking, they like to look at the audience and see what everybody else sees. They would like to see your face when they're talking to you. This is if one were live. For better viewing in the upper right hand corner where it says view, if you will click on the speakers view, that will give you a full screen picture of the person who is speaking so that you can see them better. We ask you please kindly, to avoid sex, religion, and politics. There's a reason why, not so much for us, but because our meetings are recorded. And if you're talking about those topics, they will be recorded and it will be part of our broadcast. So it might be embarrassing to someone else. We recommend that those three subjects stay out of the conversation this evening, if possible. And with that, I need to move on to our guest speaker. Now, our guest speaker tonight, John Smarge. Well, you know, I thought maybe this guy was military because when I was going through his bio, it said he got the Meritorious Service Medal and the Distinguished, and the Distinguished Service Medal. But then I read the rest of it. It said the Rotary Foundation Citation for Meritorious Service, the Rotary International Service Above Self Award, and he was at the District 6960 Rotarian of the Decade. Now, John started a little over 30 years ago with a club in Naples, Florida, still there. And he was a district governor in 69, uh, excuse me, district governor of 6960 in 1995 and 96. He's been interested and involved in several of the programs that I was in when I was a young man after getting out of high school. He was involved on the board of chairmen for the Naples YMCA, a very good organization and also uh, director of the board for the local Boy Scouts of America. He's worked with shelters for abused women and the foundation for the Girls Sports Foundation. So he's been involved in a lot of those different things. What he's gonna be talking to us now about tonight is about the hand wash project, the Haiti National Water Sanitation and Hygiene Strategy. But I got one line here that I underlined twice. I even use a marker on top of it because I want everybody to know this if you don't know already. John will serve as chairman of the 2022 Rotary International Convention Committee. 
He will be the chairman of the committee for that. So if you got something you want to sneak in in the back of his head, you might want to write him or contact him and let him know. Without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to John, and you can have screen share. I believe Randall's already given that to you. And the screen yes. is yours, John. Let me see if I can uh, get this, and I'll see from Gene Caldwater if you can see that. You can thumbs up if you can see my video. Yep, got it. Okay, great. Um, it is absolutely a, a pleasure to be here. And, and Randall, thank you so much for inviting me to, to speak today. I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, as Michael mentioned, hand wash. Hand wash stands for Haiti National Water Sanitation and Hygiene Strategy. What this is, it's a multi-decade program at an estimated cost of U.S. $2.3 billion with the audacious goal of providing clean water sanitation and hygiene education to the entire nation of Haiti. Now, I regret to begin my presentation with statistics, but I think I have to. For those of you who are not familiar with Haiti, and to understand what you would be facing if you were a citizen living in Haiti, but I'll also tell you that the statistics I'm telling you, I probably could have given them to you last year, five years ago, or maybe 30 years ago, because as much as things have changed in Haiti, some things remain the same. Now, only 30% of the people in Haiti have access to potable water within 500 meters or a 30 minute walk from their dwelling. In the rural villages where most people reside, only 24% actually have a toilet. Two million of the approximately 11 million people who would live in Haiti practice open air defecation. And so uh, as a result of these, waterborne illnesses such as cholera, typhoid, or dehydration through chronic diarrhea, will account for about 50% of the deaths in Haiti. Now, half of, of Haiti's water and sanitation infrastructure simply doesn't work. People have for years and for decades spent money in Haiti putting down water pipes, drilling wells, but they've only done it in a manner of relief short-term charity without taking consideration the long-term efforts, the development, the sustainability of this. So in my mind, charity in Haiti has failed. I'll repeat that, charity in Haiti has failed. It's time for a sustainable solution for Haiti that can once and for all resolve their water and sanitation dilemma. And then as far as I'm concerned, and most of us in our committee will serve as a blueprint for other developing countries as well. So in January of 2018, hand wash was established. What it does, it, it serves as an umbrella to bring together four entities that can help solve this water and sanitation dilemma. The first of these entities are the water and sanitation implementing organizations in Haiti. These are non-government organization, NGOs, who specialize in providing water and sanitation solutions. They might dig wells, they might create city water systems, they might provide or build micro flush toilets. List a number of those nonprofit, non-government organizations, and the list keeps growing each week. The second of these entities are the donor agencies from around the world who are positioned to fund these projects. They are things, or people like USAID, UNICEF, World Vision, the World Bank, 
and very many large governments around the world and private foundations and corporations. The third of these entities is DINEPA. DINEPA is a regulatory body within the country of Haiti, whose responsibility is to regulate water and sanitation activities. This organization, DINEPA, has under them ORPA, which is a regional body, and then local government agencies. This DINEPA operates outside of the government of Haiti, which has, over the years, had some difficulties. And finally, the last of these four entities is, of course, Rotary. And Rotary operates through District 7020, which encompasses the country of Haiti. But it also partners with champion districts around the world who have adopted a commune in Haiti to help it move forward. We also work with other Rotary clubs, districts, and the Rotary Foundation. So Handwash is the organization that can bring the players around the world together to hopefully solve this problem. Now, many people, uh, President Michael, will ask me over time, they say, you know what, this sounds really wonderful, but, but why? Why you? Why now? Why can Rotary do what seemingly nobody else has tried or been able to solve over the course of time? And I'll tell you, it's a business approach in which we've taken this. We're all volunteers except, except for our executive director. And we all come together with skill sets. Many of them are large business skill set. So I guess it begins with like an action plan. It, 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 it's a systematic, technically driven approach to gathering current data through community assessments, creating local socially driven solutions that result in a community action plan. And yes, Michael, I have said that for the last 12 or 14 months, 350 times. So let me boil down to tell you what this really means. Let's first talk about gathering data. We go into a community in Haiti armed with nothing more than a cell phone. On that cell phone, we have an app called MWater. We walk up and it might be a rotor actor who does it. It might be a Rotarian or a trusted NGO. They walk up to a water source. It might be a water pump. It might be a fountain, a cistern, or even just a creek along the side of the road. They go to M water and they press a button. And through satellite imagery, GPS tracking records their exact coordinates of where they are. They then test the pump to see if it works. If it works, they hit a green dot that says functional. They get a test kit out, test the water, if it's E. coli poison, they hit red. If it's potable, they hit green. So in the screen here, you see these green, yellow, and red dots. They signify all the water sources in that community. We then go to Google Maps, and we lay over Google Maps on top of our assessment. All those little black dots you see on the screen represent residences. We know that in each resident, there's an average of 5.5 people. We now know within a community how many people are within 500 meters of a fresh water source. We get a baseline for what water sanitation circumstances are within that community. My fellow Rotarians, we have done this now for 50% of the country of Haiti, a magnet. A, a, just a huge effort we've taken. We just signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, with the federal government of Haiti and UNICEF. And we are teaching them how to employ this process. And the federal government is now going to do what they are supposed to do. And they're going to move forward and do the rest of the country. Now, once we have this assessment, we talk about social 
driven solutions. There are 144 communes in the country of Haiti. They represent communities or regional areas or counties. We meet with them and I'm meeting here with the commune of Cavaillon. We meet with the community leaders and we show them the assessment we just did. And then we ask them a question. The question is, what are you going to do, Mr. Mayor and community leaders? What are you going to do with this data to provide potable water to your community? You see, we'll, we'll raise the $2.3 billion. We'll develop the infrastructure. But once the infrastructure is developed, it is them. It is the local community who is going to drive this thing forward. This will not function unless it is a local community driven process. We then assign a hand wash ambassador. In this case in Cavallon, it happens to be a past district governor from Rotary who lives in a community next door to him, Lakai. They then developed a community action plan, how they're gonna move this thing forward. We assure that the process embodies the core values of hand wash. These are sustainability, transparency, accountability, and a thoughtfully managed pay for service system. That is correct. We are not providing them water by charity. Our system only works if the citizens have buy-in if they understand the value of what they're being given and pay for it. So all of them will pay for the water we provide. And then finally, we provide a professional operator. In this case, it's a local bank. The local bank collects the funds, passes on a portion of it to DNEPA, the regulatory body, and keeps the rest in a fund for future upgrades and repairs so that there is sustainability, so that we don't have the problem of decades in the past with, with, with wells falling uh, in disarray. So I guess if I was there right now, Michael, I'd ask, I'd ask the question of, does this sound difficult? And people would probably be saying yes, and I'll tell you, this is the easy part. This is the easy part. The hard part we've got here is changing culture. Changing the culture of the people themselves past the concept of charity to an idea of self-sufficiency. Changing the culture of the federal government to realize that the only way they should succeed is if they operate in the way a federal government's supposed to operate. And thirdly, and probably the hardest cultural change is of those NGOs, those non government organizations who proliferate the landscape and provide what I consider in a book I read, they provide toxic charity. You see, there was a big earthquake in Haiti in 2010, you might know. Prior to the earthquake, there were 4,000 NGOs operating in Haiti. Now there are 22,000 NGOs each of them carving out a little bit of Haiti, very few with a mindset of what is good for the country at whole. Now, I, I both love and hate this photograph. I took it in January of 2020, my last trip to Haiti prior to COVID. It was out next door to a school in Lakai. Lakai Rotary Club was showing us proudly the benches and desks they had provided in school. But we, we walked outside and here is this pump. It doesn't work. On the platform there is a lawnmower. It doesn't work. But you've looked north of the pump. <clears throat> that white and blue building is a water kiosk connected to the water system in that community that doesn't work. So rather than fix the existing system, some well-wishing NGO, it could be a church group, heck, it could be a Rotary Club, spend $15,000 and put another well here, meters away from a water system, and it doesn't work. 
This happens, ladies and gentlemen, every single week in every single community in the country of Haiti. There is no concerted effort. There's no effort to collect people together and do a joint program. Hand wash is the one who is going to provide the vision and going to provide the glue to bring all these organizations together to do a collaborative program. Haiti needs hand wash to do this. And quite frankly, hand wash needs you always. We always run a Rotary Global grant. Um, right now, I just, I met, I met um, Antonina on the call today. Antonina's district of 7070 just gave us $10,000 of district designated funds and $10,000 cash to support one of our grants. Anyone who could support us, I'd, I'd love to support. But we also acknowledge that probably only about five or 10% of the money that we collect and spend will go through Rotary Foundation grants. The rest will go through those large donor agencies around the world. When we partner with them, they ask us to put up money. So we've established a 501c3 nonprofit charity in the country of the US where we can accept contributions that we can use to then uh, match these large donors. And though I want your money, and Gene Codwalder, who knows me probably best of anybody on this call, knows that I am not shy about asking for money. Most people don't answer the phone calls from me anymore because they know it's going to come with an ask for money. Though I want your money, there's something more important I need. I know who you are here on this call. I know the sphere of influence that all of you have, not only in Russia, but around the world. So I need from you as I need you to be an advocate for Haiti and for hand wash. I need for you to tell others about what we're doing. Find those global corporations, those engineers, those nonprofits, those anyone who could possibly assist us to say, be involved with hand wash. I'll finalize this, if, um, if I may, Mr. President, by telling you that um, in January of last year, when we met with the mayor of Cavillon, which was our first of, of seven pilot communes, it was one month since he, we put in the water system. At that point, 33% of the people paid their first water bill. Now, a year and three months later, we're now at 85% of the population paying their water bill. This is huge. Never before have we seen this in Haiti where people have trust in us to know that if they pay their water bill and they turn their faucet on, the water will come out next, next week and next month. And the amount that we're asking for them, about a penny a gallon, is cheaper than what they pay when they purchase water on the street. Now, also when we were there, in, um, in Haiti, I met with a number of large donors, one of which was the World Bank. The World Bank knows who we are on a global scale. They know Rotary, but the guy here in Haiti had never heard of our organization. And so he asked me a question. He said, John, how long will you be here with your project? You see, he thought of us as one of those 22,000 NGOs who walks in with a little bit of money puts in a well like that one that broke down in Lakai and walked away. I explained to him that we don't do projects. Rotary does programs. And our program will be done when we're done. When every single woman, man, and child in the country of Haiti has access to potable water, that's when we're going to be done. In fact, Rotary has a history of this. 35 years ago, some Rotarians in the Philippines said, we want to provide water, I mean, uh, uh, and polio in our country, the Philippines. And now 35 years later, we're still doing it. Before we left the World Bank in Haiti, the gentleman called us back into his office. And he sat us down and he said, I'd like to provide you with a grant. 
the grant was for 2.5 million US dollars. A lot of money, not a lot of money when you're raising 2.3 billion, but a lot of money. But what it meant to me and our teammates was that he understood us. He figured out who Rotary is and what we stand for. We stand for integrity, transparency, and impact. My fellow Rotarians, this is an audacious goal. I don't think it's going to be done in my lifetime. I don't think we'll have it done in 20 or, or 30 years. But you know what? There is no one. There is no one out there but Rotary who could do this. And we are going to prevail. So I thank you for what all you do in your clubs and around the world. I thank you for what you could possibly do in the future. And may I offer to all of you, God bless you and may God bless Rotary. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, John. Let's everybody give him a round of applause. Thank you very much, John. We appreciate that. And the way that we normally operate things here when we have a guest speaker is, John, we're gonna ask you to answer some questions for people. I'm sure some of our people will have a few questions. And leading it off is our secretary, as he is every week, he usually asks the very first question. So I'm gonna turn it over to Randall. Randall, do you have a question for John today? Um, I do have a question. I wonder if Russia has any unique technology that might be applied to a project like this. I don't know yet, Randall. We are um, we're moving this forward and trying to figure out as we go along what we need and what we and what we what we're going to accomplish. I liken it to we have boarded the plane. We've left the runway, and now we're attaching pieces and trying to build the airplane. So we're figuring out there are seven pilot communes that we're testing this on using technology from, for example, Tesla is helping us through their organization give power, and we're using their battery operated and, and their, their uh, solar systems. We will, as we go further and further, Randall, need more and more answers or questions answered. Right now, we don't know, but we'd love to find out. All right. Thank you, John. Very good. Next question. Raise your hand, please. Anybody on the screen, raise a hand if you got a question. Yes, Renya. Hi, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Very inspiring. Um, I've had training with the Global Transition Movement for Resilient Community Building, and you touched on the importance of community buy-in. Um, I'm wondering if uh, there's anything more you can say about that. Since Absolutely can. Thing, you know? I can. Um, it's interesting. Um, last week we met with uh, USAID, USAID. We're, we're up for a grant for $2 million from USAID and $2 million, $2 million from Rotary, a $4 million grant. And they've already seen, Renia, what we've done in, in our wells. And they asked us the question of why are yours successful and others are not? And the, the term we have in, to them was civil society engagement. Now, civil society engagement is when local people come together to advance a cause within their own community. Tell me what the greatest civil society organization is in the world. It's Rotary Clubs. We've got 22 Rotary Clubs and 14 Rotary Act Clubs operating in the country of Haiti. When we go to a, <clears throat> a community meeting, meeting with the locals, talking about what we're doing, Rotary members are coming. It might be a local doctor. It might be the county judge who's Rotarian. And they're coming together and saying, we're supporting this program. We understand, Renia, everything that we do is local. It is from the local upwards. We enable and engage and provide uh, a process and an operation for a local community. We have an organization called um, Operators Without Borders. Operators Without Borders is a Vancouver-based nonprofit. They're coming in and they're teaching the people in the community, 
how to operate a public utility system. There aren't any in Haiti right now. We're teaching them how to do that. We're also working with a company, an organization called Engineers Without Borders. Because right now, if you want to do an engineering project in Haiti, you get someone from Canada or the United States or, or Italy or somewhere else, and you pay their airfare to come to Haiti. At the same time you're doing that, we have bright young engineers graduating who are Haitian, who have no place to work because they can't compete with free the pro nonprofits. We're going to stop that. We're not going to have these charities come down and do the work that Haitians themselves can do. We are nation building is what we're doing, but we're doing it, as you mentioned, from the ground up from the civil society. I'm telling you, I've, uh, Michael mentioned, I, I've been a Rotarian for 38 years. I sat on the board directors of Rotary. I've done some incredible things. Nothing compared to this. Nothing compared to this. This right. is amazing to me. What, we're, what, what only Rotary can do because Rotary is in the community and our organization is made up of Rotarians. Fantastic, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jen. Next person, next hand up. Uh, Henny. Yes, uh, John. I'm uh, Henny from the Netherlands. I'm from the Rotary Club, uh, Voorschoten, Leids and Dam. Very difficult to pronounce. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for your uh, presentation. The, the, the matter is our club is uh, at the moment uh, supporting uh, a school project in Haiti. Uh, just uh, about 100 kilometers south of uh, Port-au-Prince. And it's very difficult for us to get hold of Rotarians there. Um, they're not really, yeah, active, it looks like. If you send emails, they don't come back. Um, and, and it's a pity because we are really want to support that school with uh, educating teachers, uh, students, of course, but also with hygiene, etc. cetera. Uh, it is a difficult problem, Henny. I will tell you if you send me, I put my email in the chat room. Yeah. In the chat. If you send me an email directly and show me the grant of the project, first of all, I will make sure um, <clears throat> within 24 hours they'll contact you. I kind of. Yeah, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm doing one more uh, try. I have things worked <clears throat> out. If that doesn't work out, I, I'm going to go. Please let me know. To, yeah. Here is the problem, and it's I'm not saying it's with your project, but it's a lot of projects coming from the United States and Haiti. We have Rotary Clubs in the United States who say, I want to do a wonderful project in Haiti. They send the project to Haiti and start it without the local buy-in. And then you have local Rotary Clubs who have eight, ten projects thrust upon them that they have no interest in and no skills about to handle. Right. So we are trying to, again, we have a Haiti task force that overlooks all the projects that come into Haiti that we try to, to, to oversee them and, and try to say, no, you, the, the community does not need that. Please don't give us your project. So there are more projects that they, than they can handle. The need is so great. So on an individual basis, Henny, please let me see your project. Yeah, and I will be happy to connect with the local assistant governor in in that part of Haiti and get it moved on. The, the other thing is uh, we got from the, the lady who was uh, uh, managing that project, who started the school and everything. Uh, she's a bit worried about the situation in the country. Uh, the president is uh, not going away. <laughs> he decides to stay. Uh, the mayor is... Uh, arrested at the border with 500,000 US dollars. Yeah, so uh, he, he, does the Rotary Club there have some kind of impact or, or how is yeah. it going there? The Rotary Clubs, in my experience, are made up of incredibly great human beings who try hard against all odds. Um, I, I am very confident in the credibility of the Rotary Clubs. Uh, but they need to be, make sure they are engaged in your project. In the hands of Rotary Clubs, Henny, your project is safe. Okay. Outside of that, 
it is the wild, wild west out there. You don't know what goes on. And I travel, traditionally, I travel about once a month to Haiti. I've not been there since January of 2020. And I don't have any plans to go back until the circumstances are a little bit taken, a little better there because the kidnappings are what I'm concerned about the most. And it is running rampant right now and the gang wars. So it's, it's a dangerous place to be right now. Okay. Thank you, well, John. I will let you uh, know uh, as soon please, as I... Yeah. Please do, Henny. I appreciate that. Thank you and, very and much. Henny, if for some, re if I'm some reason, Henny, you get disconnected, you know you can contact us through our club and we'll put you back in contact if there's okay. a disconnect. Just let us know. Next question. Any hands? Next question. Nobody's got a question. I've got a question for you, John. Okay. Um, I was in Rotary back in 2003 and we had several projects in India and they were going very, very well. And then after a couple of years, India got a bad reputation of mismanagement of funds and grants and so forth. And India got penalized a little bit. Is there, is there adequate um, controls or adequate uh, features there in Haiti to keep guidance going in the right direction within these Rotary Clubs? Yeah, there is. Um, we have a really great um, organization in Haiti that through hand wash that monitors those clubs. They do, they have to do a hand wash ambassador program where each club now comes together and they learn about what we're doing at hand wash, about our transparency issues, and there's a great degree of accountability. Um, Again, I'm, I know very well the leaders in Haiti, past governors and such. Um, through our program, there is no fear of, of, of accountability issues. No fear. We, um, I meet with the, the head of the, of the government of DINEPA, and he's asked me a number of times, John, well, just send me the money and we'll take care of it. And I'm normally the tough guy saying, uh, Executive General, I appreciate what you're saying, but we will never do that. Our money will be going through Rotary Clubs that we trust. That's the only way we transfer that money is through Rotary Clubs. So um, okay. it's safe. Okay. Again, I'm just, just asking because I, in India, it looked safe early and then, it, then things kind of went sour and um, they got punished a little bit because of that. But things are better there now for sure. Than what they were before so yeah yeah okay. thank you next next question any other questions from the floor uh you folks are unusually quiet this evening usually we're full of questions out there i i'm, I'm curious john if you're doing all of this by remote by being in the united states and not being down there in a year um i know a lot of our organizations have had to learn how to manage by way of zoom how to manage by way of phone calls and messages without being live. Being a live leader on spot is one thing, being a leader online of an organization is another thing. Uh, any uh, guidance you might give us for those of us who are operating at a distance from our, uh, from where the work is being done that, that you're, you're halfway around the world or not, not halfway in your case, but a long way in your case from where the work's going on? Yeah, we, um... Um, I, I'll tell you that we meet our steering committee, which is made up of 12 subcommittees and normally there's about 45 people on the call. We meet every single week. Um, I have probably six to eight Zoom meetings through different committees every single week. But of the 12 subcommittees, you need to understand that five of the chairmen or chairwomen live in Haiti. So of the 12 subcommittees, mm -hmm. Five of them are headed by people who live right there. So even though we're remote, we are fully entrenched in Haiti. And they can do all of the hands-on face-to-face -face meetings that we can't do ourselves. Okay. I just know for a lot of organizations, when I'm, I'm helping leaders around the world, I teach leadership. And I know that when this pandemic occurred, a lot of them got separated from the actual work in different locations that in fact they are uh, learning new methodologies of trying to operate with people who they don't get to see. You can't walk down the hallway to the water cooler and tell somebody something. It's not that way anymore right now. It's, uh, it's, it's 
by distance. So, okay. Uh, Howard, I've seen you had your hand up. On mute. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, John, thank you for that really uh, well-rounded uh, presentation of this active work going on in Haiti. I had no idea that Rotary was so focused, maybe through your efforts and, uh, and, and some others. But it occurred to me that uh, Haiti would not be well situated to uh, manage a COVID crisis and uh, because of its population density and things like that. I wonder if it's a little bit off the subject of your, your, um, your talk, but do you have any comments you'd like to make about uh, the, the ability of the Haitian um, infrastructure to uh, respond to the, to, to the very difficult uh, COVID? Uh, First of all, they, they closed their borders very quickly. So it became, you know, Espanol, the island came, was by itself. So people were not coming and going. So you're, you're closing your borders. Mm -hmm. And um, COVID is an immunity, right, a issue. And um, I don't know the reason. I don't know if it's because of dealing with cholera and typhoid and everything else. But they've not had as bad a case of COVID mm -hmm. in the country of Haiti as we've had in other countries. The population has not been affected, even though there was limited shutdown. There was because they most of them, the population live hand to mouth, right? They just they have to go out and earn a living today to eat tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We've not seen the instances of COVID in Haiti like you've seen other places. Mm -hmm. Again, just it might be their ability to resist it because of their immune system. I don't know. Uh, I would guess that it, this isolation would prevent the spread. And when you do that, uh, it's, it's like everybody masking, but, but they don't have to because they, uh, they, they've isolated the, the, the subset of the population within the country, as you pointed out originally. And, and uh, if we could have done that with all the other countries, <laughs> maybe, you know, it would have made a difference. But it, it, that's, it's maybe a, a, an object lesson right there. Uh, yeah, they've done well. So I know, I, I know personally of a number of people who've passed away, a lot of Rotarians who have passed away. But again, the instances have not been as high as um, the population as it has been in other countries. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sure. John. I don't see another hand up right now, so I'm going to change the subject for you, John. If you don't want to go there, that's fine, but I'm going to ask you a question about the 2022 conference. Uh, with a person like you who thinks outside the box, who's a go-getter, who doesn't say no, I mean, won't take no for an answer, who is very forward, what what, give us a clue what you're going to surprise us with that's different at the 2022 conference from say the 2018 or 2019 conference. What is going to be unique or different at the upcoming conference in 2022? Well, one is going to be, it's going to be the largest we've ever seen. Pent up demand is going to be such that we may have 40,000 people there. Okay. And um, we may actually also, if, Arrangements work the way it's supposed to be. We might be able to have an opening session where all 40,000 people are in one session. We're working now with, a, with an arena there that can hold us. No, Houston, also, uh, Houston, Houston Astrodome, only choice. Houston Astrodome. It's the, um, it's the Minute Maid Arena. Okay. Right. For the Astros play. Yeah. yeah. And it's an enclosed, beautiful location. Uh, we're, we're, we hopefully will get there. Um, one nice thing about about this will be, it'll be our first time to really talk about the environment in a convention, right? Because now with the seventh area of focus being the environment, I have a feeling a lot of what you hear from us will be environment and it will be not just flowery stories, but it will be saying, how can we partner with other large organizations around the world to have Rotary be a large player in the concepts of, of environment? We'll see that. Um, we will also have wonderful speakers. 
Uh, we had Bill and Linda Gates, and I'm not certain if you keep up with, yeah, they're getting do. divorced. So we we're do. not sure which of the two I'm going to ask to come to speak. Both. No, no, it's going to be more dynamic if you ask both of them to be on the stage at the same time, for sure. Um, we're also going to have a, um, because Houston is the home of NASA, right. the space, we're going to have a live discussion with the astronauts on the space station from the stage. So we'll be talking to them from the stage in Houston. Um, the rest you'll have to see. See, I have to be, I have to be politically correct here. I have to promote Taipei first because Taipei is our first, our next I, convention. Uh, but uh, Houston will also be one more thing is where many of the conventions have been thinking of this Zoom stream live streaming as an afterthought. We are actually developing two conventions side by side. We're developing a convention where you can come live or a convention you can come remote. And we are going to provide the, as equal a, an experience for those people who are coming by, by virtual as you would be as if you're doing it live. In fact, we're running time zone changes where we're having live activities. What that might be four in the morning for Houston, we're going to run them because we understand our audience is someplace else. We're going to be running two side-by-side -side conventions. Each will be equally impressive. Very good. Well, I knew you would have a few little tricks up your sleeve. So, um, and I'm just trying to wet the water a little bit here because not, we all we all know that the 21 is going to be online and it'll be great. I'm sure Taipei is going to do a good job. The committee is going to do a good job. It'll be fun, but it's still not live. And no. and I don't I don't know if you were. I would assume you were. But in 2005, I was in Chicago and it was. I don't know if we had 40,000, but I know it was over 30. So it was it it was really, really, really big and um, for the 100th anniversary. Yeah. And I'm not big about numbers, Michael, and, and our president-elect, uh, Shaker Mehta, yeah. um, he simply says, I don't care how many people are there, but I want it to be the best experience that if there's 10 people or 50,000, I want each of them to have the best experience they can. So though numbers are cool, we want you to walk away saying that was worth going to. Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm sure you'll be successful, no doubt in my mind. With your tenacity and going forward, uh, the chairman, I'm sure that you're going to get all the support that you can, you need, and you're going to make it happen. So we're going to be very, very happy. Matter of fact, next year, we might just chime you up again and see if you can't come in and give us a little rah-rah about the convention next year. Um, online, um, reach, reaching around the world to all these dignitaries. Um, Always be happy to, Michael. Thank we, you. We would we would like to hear that. So, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's give John a round of applause again, please, everybody. Thank you very much, John. We appreciate your effort, your time, and as you said, you've been on three hundred and something zooms. Um, that's more than I have, but uh, you probably got three hundred more to go yet this year. So. Uh, you, you've got, you're going to have your hands full with an awful lot to do. Okay, next on our agenda is to talk a little bit about our project. And I, uh, Andres Bon is on board here. Andres, you have a slight update, a little bit about finances and so forth. Can you give us a little update, please? Thank you for the floor, Michael. Um, the update is that we have more than 50% uh, Donations for a third child, uh, together with those which were announced today, we might be close to 100%. And uh, I will present to the board the numbers when we have the next board meeting and might make the proposal that we, as a club, fill it up so that we can support the third child. And uh, in parallel, we should uh, collect or continue to collect donations. Um, meanwhile, I had the chance to translate the thank you letter which we received from Makar. And if you don't mind, I would like to read it to you. Sure. Dear Rotarian St. Petersburg members, the entire Makar Gordin family expresses its heartfelt 
gratitude to you for the charitable assistance provided in the rehabilitation of our child. Thanks to your generous and kind heart, Maka had the opportunity to undergo a, a rehabilitation program in a wonderful center with real professionals. It is very pleasant to realize that in our difficult time, they are caring people who are ready to help and lend a helping hand. Thank you so much. We sincerely wish you not only prosperity in business, financial well-being, but also that all the good that you give to those in need will return to you and your families in multiples. We wish you good health, prosperity, and happiness. With thanks, Mam Makar, Dragon Veronica. Thank you for your attention. Meanwhile, I invited, together with my lovely wife, a child which also is in the rehabilitation center, is eager. Uh, we went there last week together with our little boy, Robert. They got known to each other and it looks like that they have built a friendship and uh, Igor was with us last Tuesday, visited us after all the trainings in the rehabilitation center and they both were playing here in Robert's room. So. We, we keep the contact, we, we would like to um, strengthen our bands we have with the rehabilitation centers so that the further coming donations can be forwarded to the choice. That's all what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank, thank you, Andres, for your great work. For those of you who don't know and might be new to our meetings here, Andres is our club treasurer, has been for a few years, and he is the focal point for our club to deal with the um, Children's Rehabilitation Center. In the Children's Rehabilitation Center, there's a couple of you who are new here tonight. It, it deals with cerebral palsy. Children arrive there either in a wheelchair or carry it in where they cannot walk. They go to therapy up to three months worth of therapy every day. And then after, usually they get fitted with a pair of specially made shoes designed for their feet so that they fit only them. And then by the time they leave, they're either walking with crutches or walking with braces, but they are walking. And what I wanna share with you this evening, last week we showed you a, a short video. I have another one for you this evening. It's a short one, not a long one. And it will show you another child as to in the past and what was accomplished. We're on a mission to get 10 children this year. It cost us 2,500 euros per child to do this. We've done two, we're working on a third one and our goal is 10. We will get there this year, but we still need your help. And we just had contributions from people who are on the screen this evening, as well as others. So if you're willing to donate, please contact us and we'll be more than happy to pass it on. 100% of it goes to the center. We don't use any of it. We're just a funnel to funnel it through to get to them. So. Uh, it's working pretty well, but we certainly can use your help to get more children. And you can see Andres and his son, Robert. Now, Robert's got a new friend, Igor. So um, uh, Rob Robert uh, has a new one to play with. And, and I'm happy to hear that not only is Andres uh, supporting the center, but also his family's involved in it. So that's very, very good. Makes a very strong bond for us with that group. That pretty much wraps it up for us this evening. Um, I don't know if our members, we've got a few members on board here. Uh, Rami, have you got any comments or any information you want to provide us? I think that is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Andres, uh, Bone, anything you got for us, sir? Andres, nope, nothing's shaking his head. Irina, any information you have, dear? Not now, thank you. Okay, all right. And Antonina, you're a charter member of our club. Do you uh, have any information for us? No, it's just uh, we are approaching a celebration of um, victory over Nazi in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's May 9th. Right. So it's my greetings to everyone and um, my hope that peace will be a future of the human being. 
on the earth someday. Well, so. we, cert we certainly hope so, Antonina. And, and, I, and believe me, I don't think there are many people who are in our age group on the screen here who forget about May 9th. Uh, I think we all think about that and think about the, what had happened. I was, we, making a com I was making a comment to somebody the other day and they were surprised. I didn't think they should be, but they were, they were surprised. Since World War II, there has not been one single event that affected so many countries and so many millions of people around the world as this virus has. This virus has been the next biggest thing since World War II, in my opinion. You can agree or disagree, but I know that just about every country in the world has been affected just as a quote unquote world war, not a regional war, but a world war. Um, reached everybody in the world, and this virus has done that also now. So um, people will be remembering this period of time, the last 14 months, and how many more months we don't know. They will remember this for a long, long time because it's something who took many people out, uh, millions of folks. In America, we're over, over 570,000 already and working our way to 600,000. So I know in America's numbers, I don't know all the global numbers, but I do know that it is bad. So we are living through it. Our children is living through it. Our small, small children may not remember it, but certainly anyone above the age of six or seven up, to, up through us will remember what these years right now are like that we're going through. So while we're Rotarians, while we're doing things around the world, while we are helping people, the world is in the middle of a crisis that it hasn't seen since World War II. And we're still able to do it. I think that says something about the backbone of Rotarians. That says something about the backbone of our organization, how strong it is, how well it's built, and how it continues to function in sight of the fact that we have so much diversity thrown at us. So I thank all of you as Rotarians around the world. And I appreciate you folks coming here this evening to our meetings and our weekly meetings here. Thank you very, very, very much. And to those few people who have already made donations in the past week or past month, thank you very, very much for your donations. We really, really appreciate them. We will try to get that third child sometime soon and we'll let you know who that is. Is there anyone with any other comment before we close the meeting? Randall. Henny, I'll get to you in a minute. Just Randall. very briefly, I just want to uh, thank Natalia, who has sent me money today. I received a notice that she's sent uh, another 500 Canadian dollars. And Antonina last week sent 100 Canadian dollars, which I received uh, as happy money. She was very happy. And so I will be passing that in rubles to uh, Treasurer uh, thank, Andreas. Thank you very much. Thank you Antonina and Natalia, thank you very much, both of you. You've been continuous supporters, and we really, really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Henny, you had a comment. Yeah, I just want to tell, show, show my appreciation also for what you guys are doing, and I'm always happy to join the meeting. It's very interesting. Well, you're, you're and, always, you're always and today, welcome. And today we are celebrating liberation in Holland. So Very good. Very good. Also, uh, if, I don't know if we got anybody on the screen who is of uh, Spanish descent, but Cinco de Mayo is today. These, the, the, the Spanish are celebrating Cinco de Mayo. So um, I only, I, I did it in a strange place. For the only time I ever celebrated Cinco de Mayo is in East Los Angeles. Um, very interesting environment to celebrate Cinco de Mayo in East Los Angeles, kind of different than other places. Uh, but uh, it is Cinco de Mayo today, and we do recognize them as well as all the other nationalities around the world. So we have been at it for an hour and a half. It is time for me to close our meeting. We're gonna hang around for about another, oh, eight to nine minutes and chat. Anybody has any comments or questions or anything, feel free, chime in. I'm gonna close the meeting. The meeting is officially closed and we hope to see all your smiling faces back next week. Is
it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rotary four-way test. Now many years ago, in 1932, his company was headed down. He knew not what to do. Then Herbert Taylor started on a quest To keep his team from certain doom He wrote the four-way test Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it fill goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rotary four-way test Adopted some years later by Rotarians worldwide Some simple rules for dealing with the people by your side A guide for life's decisions, no doubt one of the best Just 24 quite simple words The four-way test Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it fill goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rotary four-way Or on the playground with your friends at school You'll find that hurtful words and actions Really aren't too cool So as you make your choices Of what to do or say Remember that old four-way test And you will be okay Is it the truth? 